Hello, I'm Dr. Rob Califf, and I'm delighted to be here at the American College of Cardiology meetings in Atlanta. I want to welcome you to this next session in which I interview notable people in cardiology so that we can understand them better. It's a special privilege today to be with Dr. Ralph Brendis, a good friend for many years, and my former chief resident. That still brings a little fright, I think, into <laughs> most house officers, but we'll try to get over that. But it's great to be here with Ralph uh, to discuss uh, what led to his being the new uh, president of the American College of Cardiology. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here with a, a longtime friend. I used to say old friends, but I've changed to long time at this point. <laughs> well, Ralph, let's get right into it. Where, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, people from New Jersey say exit, what exit they're from. So I'm from uh, exit nine. Uh, fairly normal childhood. Actually went to a boarding school, prep school, and then from there off to MIT in, in Boston. I always had you pegged for the prep school type. I was wondering, <laughs> I was a public school guy myself, but why, why did you go to prep school? What led to that? Well, that's, that's probably <clears throat> an interest. I probably was an underachiever uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my early adolescent years, and uh, my father had gone to prep school in, the, in Massachusetts, so I guess it was, you know, what, what you do. It is kind of interesting that you asked that question because I have two younger sisters. They, do, they were not afforded the opportunity of prep school, but probably they were better students than me. So you're a little bit rebellious, I would guess, as a teenager. Uh, I guess so. You're, so. What are your sisters doing now? I have one sister who's a lawyer in Southern California, and the other is uh, doing a lot of volunteer work up in uh, Oregon. Great. And I know your parents have been very important to you, and you, you are very close. Um, with your parents as you were growing up. I suspect some of those teenage years brought some bonding that perhaps uh, w was special. Tell us a little bit about your parents. Well, my dad, I have to say, was uh, in all honesty my biggest fan growing up. Um, and I think a lot of my actions to this day are, are really uh, generated uh, uh, through him and I think about him often. Uh, it's kind of interesting, he, he actually uh, went to MIT also uh, and then ended up going into the leather goods uh, business and, uh, and finally sold his business when he was assured that I actually was going to pass medical school <laughs> and get through it, uh, which is, uh, I felt, always found kind of cute. What, it, what it, it, interesting aspects relating to the advances in cardiovascular disease, he would ask me questions, of course, related to his own cardiovascular health. He had hypertension, uh, he had elevated cholesterol, uh, his father died at a young age of uh, coronary disease, actually when I was one year old and uh, he was about 50, 51. And it, it just shows you the advances in cardiology because he had a cholesterol 240, which at the time I thought was just fine. Uh, his, um, uh, he wasn't a smoker uh, and his blood pressure control was certainly not at a level that we would consider adequate today. And so he had his first myocardial infarction at age uh, 61. And, ended up with a bypass operation and, uh, and then 10 years later, as typical we see, he had return of symptoms. He had his first bypass before the, uh, uh, the, uh, the full introduction of the mammary artery bypass, which uh, I think led to his early uh, problems and then unfortunately actually died on the table during his second bypass. It must have really been brutal for you being, you were a doctor by that time, right? Yes, I actually was a cardiologist. so. So I know that was tough. Very hard. In fact, I think it actually influenced my decisions for, for the next six months. Every time I reviewed angiograms making decisions, I just would constantly remember his angiogram, and, uh, but eventually we move on. What about your mom? I know you, you said last night in your acceptance speech as uh, the president that uh, she's still having a big influence on you. Well, she's a tough taskmaster. You know, I would be the... You'd bring home a good report card, it was never good enough. Um, uh, always my worst critic, but I guess in a constructive way. Uh, as I mentioned last night, she, till this day, despite her 85 years of age, continues to try to educate me both through medical and non-medical uh, information. And I think she personally thinks I'm responsible for the dysfunctional healthcare <laughs> system. I think your mom and mine have a lot in common. Uh, as, as you, I think you know, my mom actually logged on to the heart.org and critiqued Peter Slight from one of these um, <laughs> interviews. So, but but uh, mothers are really um, critical, and I think um, influences throughout time. So MIT, I mean, I, I have two sons that are engineers. Why didn't you become an engineer? I thought everybody went to MIT, turned out that way. 
Well, I think you know, one of the interesting things for me about MIT <coughs> is I uh, was happy when I left and realized I wasn't as stupid as I thought I was when I was there. Those engineers, including your son, they're just, they're just too darn smart. Uh, MIT probably was the wrong school for me. I went, again, probably uh, due to my, the influence of my dad. But was, what was great about MIT is they actually, uh, as opposed to large, big public schools, really took people under their wing. I had a lot of influences there. There was a clinical research center, uh, um, Robert Lees of the Fredrickson and Lees uh, cholesterol classification was there. And I spent time there doing uh, research, had patient uh, interactions, actually got a paid position there. And then a young, uh, young researcher there, Dana Wilson, uh, actually helped mold my interest in going into medicine. So you knew you were going to be a doctor when you went to MIT? Is no. That no, this so actually what? was generated during that time. Oh, that's fantastic. Was there a moment when you made the conversion? Uh, not in particular. It was sort of a, uh, something that occurred over time. Again, I had no family infants related to medicine, uh, but I think my experience at the Clinical Research Center at MIT was uh, very molding for me. So you and I came along in the time of the Vietnam War, which I think influenced anyone who was around at that time. It's actually hard to describe to, pe to people who weren't there at the time, but I know you had some interesting experiences. I still remember the day my draft number came, 312, and uh, you know I had a big celebration, but what I didn't think about was the people that had lower draft numbers um, who were facing a very difficult situation. Well, you know, it was a tough time. Um, you know, it's interesting in today's era, we don't have a draft, so I think it influences how, how college students uh, behave related to uh, their concerns related to Iraq or Iran, you and I were faced with something very different. There was a draft. In fact, probably a lot of my time at MIT, rather than studying, was focusing on anti-war activities, although not as active as some of our other members of the college uh, in that particular area. But when it came time for my draft uh, 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 lottery number, I, my, I was going to be picked, and uh, it was clear to me that uh, serving in Vietnam was just not where I was uh, emotionally in terms of support of that particular war. I'll make it perfectly clear I'm very much in support of our country, but uh, at that time the war uh, just made no sense. And um, I basically did everything I could to uh, make sure that I didn't. My inability to uh, not obtain a conscientious objector status, I basically uh, uh, went as a yippie to my physical and was found, if you will, mentally unsuitable to the Army way of life. So I think in, a, in an odd kind of a way, perhaps, um, that experience, I suspect, may have prepared you for what you're going to face now, <laughs> probably in the most unusual yeah. time in the history of the uh, profession of cardiology, where we have 50% uh, or so of the practices have folded into health systems in one year, and there's so much uncertainty about what the future of the profession is. Um, you're going to have to be able to withstand uh, all sorts of uh, forces. We'll, we'll get back to that later, but following your life story, you, you ended up then down at Emory. Um, I did. It's a long way from New Jersey. Well, I'm going to just, I want to react to that earlier statement you made. Uh, one of the comments I've been making this week in honoring Fred Beauvais is, uh, in his year of presidency is that maybe uh, I, watching him act related to all the changes in health care, the soldier that he is, the way he uh, has dug down and uh, worked for the college and worked for the membership, I realized maybe if I hadn't avoided the draft and actually served in the military, I would have attained more of the skills that Fred has that would better prepare me for this coming year. Yeah, I, I really agree um, your assessment of Fred. He's an amazing guy, and I think uh, having served like he did is a, is a, is a great thing, and he obviously learned a lot from it. But we're all different and we all have different experiences. So what, what precipitated the Emory move? Well, the good news is that it was a school that actually accepted me. It actually took me a couple years to be accepted to medical school because of, the, of my uh, draft status. Um, like all, all, sometimes all things come uh, to a reason. I think by the time I got to medical school, I approached it differently. I was more mature. But as you know, Rob, the most important thing that occurred during that transition is that I met my wife, Claire, during my ma attaining a master's degree in public health at UCLA. And she clearly has been a, a huge influence in making, uh, making who I am. And as uh, you know, that uh, she is my personal trainer and I'm, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> 
But Emory turned out to be just an incredible experience. Uh, Jimmy Carter was our governor, Maynard Jackson was our mayor, and uh, to be able to be in the environment at Emory and be able to uh, learn medicine under Willis Hurst and Bruce Logue and be able to practice at the Grady uh, Hospital System was incredible. Uh, there were things we were doing as medical students that nobody in many academic centers has the opportunity to do. And so by the time I got to my internship, I felt I, was at a, I had a significant advantage over some of my colleagues. Now, other than Claire, who we'll come back to later, who, who had the biggest influence on you at Emory in terms of your thinking about the future? Well, I think, uh, I think I, uh, the strength of the cardiology program there probably influenced, uh, put the imprint about becoming a cardiologist. Uh, what particularly impressed me, of course, uh, is the emphasis on the physical examination, uh, particularly auscultation of the heart. Clearly a lost art, and uh, again, you and I both had the experience at UCSF of having mentors that were particularly uh, good in that skill. So I have to say, you know, as, I, as a teacher, I spend a lot of time on physical diagnosis and clinical auscultation. Other uh, mentors was a gastroenterologist uh, named Jerome uh, Hirschman. So you, you uh, obviously did well at Emory, had a great time, and were moving along towards a career. Why did you want to go to San Francisco? Well, you know, I, I felt pretty lucky at Emory. I, again, I, initially my response was just to prove to other medical schools they were wrong and, mm -hmm. and rejecting me. And, um, and so I studied very hard, did very well at Emory. And so I was in a good position that I could almost choose where I wanted to go. And San Francisco, I tell you, when you, uh, when you go out there and you have your interviews and you're sitting at the VA looking out at the Golden Gate Bridge, it's a, it's a pretty strong impetus to go west. I had the same experience, so I'm with you there. So you started your internship. Uh, Holly Smith, obviously uh, a major influence on many of us. What, what are your memories of uh, Holly? Although it, it's not like he's gone, he's still quite active in the San Francisco area. You know, it's it's funny that you say that. I still run into Holly, and I still hold him uh, at, at, at in total reverence. He is one of the one of the most unique people in the world of medicine. He's an ambassador. He's brilliant. The way he can way he builds departments, uh, the way his insights in all aspects from both a low level, mid level, but particularly at a high level and, and putting all the pieces together. And uh, he just comes across as the ultimate statesman in, uh, in medicine. Well, of course, I attribute his brilliance to the fact that he's a South Carolina man <laughs> uh, where he grew up, not far from where I grew up, but he's had a, a huge influence on me and still I love to listen to him uh, talk about things. So you, you, you knew you were going to be a cardiologist when you started at UCSF? I think it was still imprinted, but uh, this, you'll find this sort of humorous in that uh, I did know I wanted to stay in San Francisco, so I literally applied to two residencies, uh, two fellowships, uh, gastroenterology at UCSF and cardiology at UCSF. And uh, I literally, to the day I walked into Parmley's office after being accepted to both, did not know what I was going to tell Bill. Uh, but at the end of the line, I decided it would be better to create your own lumens rather than look at <laughs> lumens that are already there. There's some good <laughs> jokes about uh, what gastroenterologists do. We should probably defer those for this, uh, for this interview. So I, I arrived uh, behind you in that um, internship and remember meeting you as a senior pretty serious guy, really working hard in a, in a uh, complex environment, uh, doing a lot of teaching. You, you seem to love teaching. No, oh, thank you. Do you still get to teach in the Kaiser system? Well, it's, um, you know, these days, of course, I find myself mostly in an airplane flying back and forth, something that you can relate to, Rob. Uh, but I still find that teaching is the most uh, in enjoyable aspect of my medical career. Uh, I think that uh, the, the validity, face validity that um, a leader of the American College of Cardiology has by being an active clinician rather than a retired one is huge, even though it puts a lot of extra burden on me and probably my colleagues. So this year and last year, basically, I take full call, and full call uh, represents doing a lot of the teaching service. I'm pretty, pretty much a strange duck, you know, and uh, the, I think that the experiences that the house staff have and in interacting with someone with whatever perspective I bring is probably uh, worthwhile. My colleagues tolerate me because the, of the full call, of course, my availability is all the holidays <laughs> throughout the year. 
Well, I'm really glad you're still teaching because I think it's critical that young people get exposed to people like you that have been around the block and have a perspective that's different than just practice, but you're still practicing, which is also critical. Just a word about the cardiologists at UCSF that trained you and me, Kanu Chatterjee, William Parmley. What? Well, you and I were uh, very blessed. Uh, Parmley, uh, a terrific mentor, although uh, I kind of joke in retrospect, we used to call him the Pan Am Professor because he of all his travels while he was president during our time there. I guess I probably travel more, <laughs> more than he did, so I should be careful on that moniker. But he had a, a lot of insight, and of course he ran the Jack Journals for a long period of time, and, and uh, his ethics and scruples are, are, are just un, unparalleled. And Kanu Chatterjee, Mel Chetland, and Mel Scheiman, incredible, and Nora Goldschlager, incredible people for us as mentors and clinicians, and how they always kept the patient first, and no matter what they did, despite the superb uh, teaching. One of the particular things that you and I uh, had the pleasure is that Mel uh, Chetlin and Kanu Chatterjee, their bedside skills were unbelievable. People from around the world would come just to be able to be on CCU rounds. Yeah, quite remarkable. Now you taught me an, another bedside skill. I have a vague recollection of this, but didn't you teach me it's best to uh, bob and weave if a patient takes <laughs> a, a right hook at you? I knew you were gonna go for that line, but um, uh, for the audience, uh, Rob, of course, uh, was my intern. In fact, Rob, uh, Eric Topol, and Dean Kariakis were my interns as I was a resident. And I'm at, uh, always impressed that despite the barrier of me being the resident, the greatness that all three have obtained. The story that Rob, of course, is referring to is that in, our, in CCU days in the general, uh, the resident actually slept closer to the, to the unit than the intern. And in those days, lidocaine prophylaxis was routine post, uh, after myocardial infarction. We had a, a young uh, lawyer who, we, for an inferior infarct, we gave lidocaine prophylaxis for. The nurses awoke me from sleep because he was having, he was uh, altered mental status. I walked in groggy and he just gave me a left hook that uh, floored me. And I think, Rob, then you were called and it was, I think I remember it being a code five call, but I don't think it was. <laughs> but I came running in there and there was a patient looking just fine. And there was this guy lying on the floor out cold. <laughs> that was Dr. Brennan. <laughs> Thanks for your resuscitation. So we did resuscitate you. And look, now you, uh, your brain's actually working. So I'm uh, pleased about that. Well, let, let's uh, just a minute about Claire, because I think um, she is brilliant. She's a major force at UCSF now in healthcare policy and uh, somehow she stood by you all these years. That must be a remarkable thing. Well, Claire indeed is the other, uh, I am the other Dr. Brindis. It's uh, all about Claire. I mean, I, uh, I can't say enough about Claire and, and of course you've known Claire over the years, uh, for the last 30 years. Um, she really has been my personal trainer and her career has gone uh, great guns to no surprise of you, I'm sure. Her initial expertise is in her, with her doctor in public health related to maternal and child health was in teenage pregnancy. But uh, she's continually advanced and now actually is the director of the Institute of Health Policy at UCSF. And what particularly impresses me about Claire's skills is uh, they love the boss. They really love Claire because what she does is she's an absolute superb mentor, looks at making uh, uh, relationships between people, between groups, uh, and, you know, they're not a, all bosses are like that. It's There's a good lesson skill. there for a lot of people, I, yeah. I think. So if you don't mind, let's fast forward now. You, you went through a great career at Kaiser, and, you know, I applaud you for um, really, you, you were a real doctor in a, uh, in a uh, forward-looking uh, health care system. And then you got involved with the college. What motivated you to um, get really involved with the college? You know, again, it's about mentors. I happened to fall into a, a nice opportunity. Uh, Dan Elliott had this committee called Private Sector Relations, uh, and I guess I was the HMO boy on that committee. Also through the California chapter, Nora Goldschlager had uh, recommended me uh, as a potential governor and um, chapter president, and that worked out. So I had entrance to both the national and the chapter scene at about the same time. The next thing that happened uh, was that uh, they had an ex officio position on what was called the old database committee. Dan Elliott uh, was very concerned about the college wasting money related to a potential registry that were had. 
And he asked me, as a favor to him, could you serve as the ex officio from the Private Sector Relations Committee on this database committee? So I said, sure. I showed up and uh, was quickly wowed by what Bill Weintraub uh, was doing uh, and became an active participant in the database committee. The next thing that happened is the college appropriately was still concerned about um, about the cost and investment <coughs> uh, of the um, uh, monies that we were spending to try to develop a database or a registry. And uh, when Bill's term uh, ended, they asked me if I would take on the role, which made no sense to me because there were a lot of people around the table that were true uh, experts in database management or cardiovascular outcomes experts. Uh, but I was asked to do that beca simply because I was not one of those people with the thought that I could at least tell them when we should pull the plug on the, on the <laughs> registry. Well, it turned out it grew a lot under your leadership, didn't it? Well, thank you. I think uh, for me, it was uh, just coming at the right time. It filled, the registry was uh, about to fill a huge need for the country, a huge need for hospitals, a huge need for physicians. And I would view that my role was to be a, a good cheerleader and spokesperson and make sure, as you uh, well appreciate, Rob, having the right people around you uh, with the skill sets necessary to, to take the agenda forward. So let, let's end with a few minutes on uh, that, that I, I see it as sort of merging this quality thing that you've been a major proponent of and have had a huge influence on your role as president of the college and the tremendous political change that's going on in medicine today. What, what do you think is going to happen with health care reform? Well, I, think, I, I don't think anyone, uh, <coughs> either you nor I or uh, people who are more in, even in the trenches will know what will happen. Uh, I just hope uh, that uh, Congress has, uh, has enough uh, courage to move forward. Uh, the concept of, of uh, not having uh, uninsured people covered makes no sense. And the, the Republican plan covering just a couple million makes no sense. And even the Democratic plan isn't going to meet our needs. But we've got to push as a professional society, as human beings, as physicians, to keep on pushing Congress to make sure that we have equal care for, for everyone. The biggest concern that I have related to all of the health care reform um, agendas that have been going on in Congress is they haven't been brave enough in either uh, party to even think about true financial reform. And to me, that you're, you can't have health, true health care reform unless you have true financial reform. And as you know, our system right now has misaligned incentives. We, re we reward for uh, quantity, and we really need to figure out how to reward for quality. So obviously, to a lot of cardiologists, it's worrisome now, given the cuts that have already occurred in cardiology pay. What do you think is going to happen over the next couple of years? I think it's going to be a tough time for our colleagues. And uh, there can be a number of responses that um, my fellow colleagues in cardiology could have, Another, a number of responses that even the American College of Cardiology could have. I mean, one could be that we could hunker down and func function as a guild, uh, looking at protecting our incomes. Or the others is that we could uh, function as a professional society, holding our professional values high. I can tell you that when I go to Congress and I talk about, and I do, of course, advocate strongly against the Medicare cuts, the SGR issues, the, uh, the 2010 physician payment rules and whatever, if you come talking about, about a money issue, you do not have anybody's uh, in Congress's attention. You have to talk about it from a patient-focused uh, approach. You have to talk about it uh, from access to care, socioeconomic and racial disparities, because that's the only thing uh, that will get their attention. In fact, I'm amazed, to be honest, uh, because I know those are values that the present administration clearly has. And I don't think uh, Sebelius and Obama truly understand the impact of what's going on and how it, that's actually truly their plans related to cuts across the board for cardiologists is actually going to increase social and, uh, socioeconomic and racial disparities. Well, Ralph, let, let's assume no one knows exactly how to get from where we are today paying for doing more to where we want to go, which is paying for higher quality in the services that we deliver. But could you give us just a framework for how you'd like to see it go? I know it can't be done overnight. 
Well, the good news is that the college has put forward to, for example, Medicare, the concept of a number of uh, pilot projects related to issues of appropriate use criteria and other uh, payment models. And uh, again, the good news, at least, that Medicare is having a, you know, a substantial amount of money, a small amount of money, maybe $10, million, $10 billion or whatever, uh, $10 million to be able to look at some of these uh, pilot projects. The problem, of course, is that this is going to be an insidious and slow uh, process. I'm very proud of some of the things that the college has done in terms of the development of these appropriate use criteria um, documents related to imaging and procedures. And I'm very uh, also encouraged about our development of actual bus uh, in embedding these models, appropriate use criteria in decision support tools and other met methods that we actually can help uh, physicians in, in ordering. You know, a lot of the tests that we order aren't ordered by cardiologists, they're performed by cardiologists. Internists, nurse practitioners order these tests. In fact, some of our publications uh, that we've had related to our own pilot project with, the, with United Healthcare has demonstrated that more uh, non-cardiologists order more inappropriate tests uh, than cardiologists. The problem that we have here is that the cardiologist to call up the internist and nurse or whatever saying this test isn't necessary is basically in our present payment model shooting themselves in the foot. So we need to move all our appropriate use criteria upstream and again we need to align the incentives so that, uh, that people get rewarded and not penalized for doing the right test for the right person at the right time. So if there's one take home message for the cardiologists who might be looking at this, what would it be? Well, I would uh, encourage you, uh, one, to uh, continue being patient focused. Two, actually I'd be very interested in your involvement both at a chapter level and also nationally. Uh, I, and uh, despite the hesitancy of saying this because I get a lot of emails, I am interested in what you have to offer and counsel that you have for me. But stay in this, I think, to be, uh, even though these are tough, uh, tough uh, financial times, there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that we will push the value of the cardiovascular specialist and the nation and our patients appreciate of all your work. And at, and at the end of the day, we will be financially solvent. That's great. Now, one last question. Now, you have two great sons who have been very successful. You have a beautiful granddaughter. When all is said and done, what would you like them to remember about Ralph Brindis? Well, uh, that I was a good father and that I loved them and uh, hopefully that I had uh, have demonstrated some traits uh, that they might want to emulate and the ones that they shouldn't figure them out and, and not do that. I can't tell you, uh, Rob, uh, how special it was to have uh, my family there last night and uh, to share in that event with me. It was, it was an incredibly emotional event. Well, that's great, Ralph. It's been tremendous being friends with you, playing golf and other sports, and look forward to doing it for at least another 25 years. Thank you very much, Rob. Well, I want to thank you for listening in today. It's been a lot of fun to talk to an old colleague and mentor, Ralph Brendis, my former chief resident. I think the college is in good hands. Mm -hmm.